Wait, what is... You know what? My hair's just gonna be like that. It's gonna be how it is. <laughs> okay. Okay, there we go. Yay, we did it. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? How was your Friday? A blizzard is coming. Oh, the Northeast is getting a really bad, bad blizzard right now, isn't it? Well, stay safe. Blizzards are... I think people underestimate them, like, if they don't know... Like, well, I think it's, if you live in a state where, like, snowstorms are normal, it's okay. But if you don't, it's, everything gets fucked up. A losing electricity in a snowstorm is not fun. Ooh, 8 to 12 inches? Oh, that's a lot. I mean, I will take half of the snow. If you, if you could do that, I'd take half of it. All right, so just let me get things... This is going... Da, da, da. How'd you guys like the video today? Have you guys watched it yet? If you didn't, no judgment. <laughs> but part of what I wanted to do today is I don't usually post videos on Fridays, but I wanted to see what you guys thought about that just to sort of test, like, you know, having, if everyone wanted to, I guess, a discussion about the video topic. Because I know I get people after those videos come out that are like, oh, I have this question, or you didn't say this, or whatever, and I just feel like this could be a good time to, like, have that discussion, if that's the thing people want. Yeah, the one I just did about soft slash gentle Dom, which is still, like, I didn't know what to title it. Because it's, like, do I put gentle slash soft Dom? Do I just say soft? Do I put femdom in there? Like, what do I say? That one was confusing, for sure. What kind of microphone setup do you have? Um, I have a Shure, what is this, an M, was MK something? Um, I need, where can I check what this is? <laughs> it doesn't actually say the thing on the mic itself, like what, which one it is. I have to like look it up. Uh, it's a Shure, uh, sorry, not MK, MV7. However, I do have it, um, hooked up to a... Uh, it's supposed to be a, like, a, a built-in, like, microphone stand. However, as you can see by the fact I'm not using it, it doesn't, uh, work. So, I have it hooked up to, like, a completely different inline thing, which I've mean to change for forever, but it's, like, I had to replace, like, all of my equipment in the past year, and so I, like, I need to get new headphones, I need to either replace this or get a different cable set up. I don't know. There's like a bunch of stuff going on. Technology is not my friend. Yeah, it's the MV7, not the MV52. I'm not really sure what the difference is between the two. Honestly, I just like looked for one that had good reviews. TBH. That was really up. So before we get too far into things, hi everyone, thank you for watching. This is an interactive Q&A live stream, so basically you guys ask questions, I answer them, we hang out, we have a fun chill time. It is an 18 plus only live stream, so as it says right down here, right below my face, 18 plus only. If you're not at least 18, please do not be here because we do talk about adult subjects. And also please do read the rules below. Just some general guidelines, FAQ, all that good stuff down there. If you do ask a question that is covered in the FAQ, I will likely not have time to answer it. But in general, I do answer things in the order they come in. And I do generally have some topics I want to bring up. Like, uh, something's in the title, perhaps, but otherwise it's kind of whatever, polyamory, asexuality, BDSM, kink, fetishes, whatever. Kind of just all fair game. So, I have to, before we get into anything else, I have to say, the sexy M&Ms. I didn't, I'm not going to make a video about it. I don't know what else I could possibly say other than... People are mad they made the M&M's less sexy. And what I find very funny is that it's possible that... I, I don't think that whatever Tucker Carlson is saying on the air is his own personal opinions necessarily. Someone on the Fox News like writing staff wrote that bit about the M&M's and was like, this is it. 
<laughs> we're gonna make him say that the, they they desex the M and M's. And what I find it very hilarious is the implication is that Tucker Carlson has a high heel fetish <laughs> because he's upset that they moved from having one type of heel to having a flat heel, and that just d that doesn't do it anymore. And you know what? If we can't have sexy M and M cartoons. What is the point of being an American, really? <laughs> so what, what else could be? What else do we have to live for as Americans, truly? All the tuckheads are freaking out. It's a hilarious statement. Do you want to have sex with candy? Listen, I, I am happy for anyone that has a fetish for the M&Ms. Because the Rule 34 porn that is going to come out as a result of this... I don't, I don't have to look. I just know. And I, you know what? Great stuff. <laughs> Happy for them. I just find it hilarious that people are mad that the M&Ms are in their mind, by the way. Like, is it objectively true they're less sexy? They're just postulating. They're like, listen, we can't have M&Ms that I can't jerk off to. That is a crime. That is violating my rights. I just, that's so funny. I just, I haven't thought about M&Ms in like three years. Like, how, how much of, how, how does your brain work that you're like, this is a thing that I need to pay attention to, you know? Oh my God, you're so right. Sexy M&M will be the hot Halloween costume. It will. Next year. It's going to, it's going to be all the rage. They freaked out about Minnie's new pantsuit. Oh, was that Candace Owens who did that? She was like, but then Candace Owens wears pantsuits and it's like. So it's all, all cartoon characters have to wear dresses, but women in real life can wear pants. I got it. <laughs> cool. I actually, I think that may like, you can only update the red polka dot dress so many times, right? Like, I, I, you gotta have... The only thing... I personally do not like the combination of blue and black. I know, controversial take. I think it would have been cuter if they would have done, like... Like a light purple, maybe? Or, like, a pink? I don't know. But I don't think they're gonna get rid... See, this is the thing that... If they're mad about this... I don't think they're gonna get rid of the iconic red. Because Minnie's had, like, a bunch of outfits over the years, right? Like, there's always gonna be... At Disneyland, you're always gonna be able to buy red bow Minnie Mouse ears because it's still going to be iconic. I mean, here's the thing though. Did they realize that they removed the red bows from her shoes long before <laughs> they added the pantsuit look? Listen, there is constant change. And she even, she only wear, at one point, get the, Liz, okay, I can't show this on screen because I don't have that, this set up for the chat, but look at the steam the steamboat willy like air like the very early mini mouse stuff girls full free the nipple okay <laughs> like she's only wearing a skirt and bloomers like the if she had titties they would just be out and i feel like the conservatives should be mad about that but no they're mad about the pantsuit <laughs> i love the idea of mini mouse as a free the nipple feminist icon <laughs> that would be so great. It's for a special event. Okay, well then it doesn't even like fucking like matter. Like, who cares then? Like, okay, her main outfit isn't changing, but then, oh no, one time she had a different colored suit. Like, is this, this is the level of, of fear that we're dealing with apparently. Am I muted? Uh. Oh, are you guys asking about the, is this like the thing with the, the viral dress, dress photo where it was like, is it white and gold or blue and black? I always saw it as blue and black, but I think the actual dress is like in real life, white and gold. Ooh, you got your collar? Congrats. I hope you like it. The one thing I always found that was a problem with, like, those ribbon collars is sometimes they can be scratchy to wear them for a long period of time. Yeah, she wore blue and white. It was, like, a like a tealy, 
or like robin's egg blue blue or like a baby blue one of those wheelhouse of colors in white but like was girl was only wearing a skirt and those <laughs> oh you muted the tab oh okay i know that's what i'm mad about is like there's so many other things you could devote your time to but what you're choosing to devote your time to is is it is being mad that Minnie Mouse has a pantsuit for an event one time. Minnie Mouse is allowed to have a diverse wardrobe, okay? Fashion icon, all right? <laughs> Listen, green and pink is the only correct answer. All right, so, oh, welcome, Galittle. It's been a while since you've been here. How have you been? Oh, was it blue and black? I don't even remember. I gotta, okay, now that we're talking about this, I have to Google this. Was the dress blue and black? This is the truth the internet needs. Oh, the dress is actually blue and black. Although most people saw it as white and gold. Oh, I, okay, I thought I was, I just assumed I was wrong. I just assumed I didn't see it correctly. Apparently it was actually, it has a Wikipedia page. It has a Wikipedia page, and it's called The Dress in Italics. I'm not, I'm not kidding you right now. It's literally what it's called. <laughs> oh my god, that's great. I love it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Oh man, that's a great... I love how at the beginning of live streams, we're always just like unhinged, and we just... <laughs> talk about whatever it's great so i'm gonna go back i've been at the bottom of the chat for a little while i'm gonna go back to the top of the chat and just like see see how everyone's doing see what's going on been a fan especially of your updates on manson oh i should bring this up really quickly because i'm not going to do a video on this because i'm if i do a video about it it'll be after part two comes out so i did watch the documentary that you may know about that came out at the Sundance Film Festival. They had an online screening of it. There was a documentary that Evan Rachel Wood, now waiting for all the Manson stands to come find me now that I've said that, uh, Evan Rachel Wood made a documentary alongside Amy Berg, who is the director, who is really well known for her previous documentary works. Uh, usually she did one that was exposing uh, CSA in the Catholic Church, in the fundamentalist Mormon, not the, the regular Mormons, but the fundamentalist Mormons, whatever that abbreviation is, and um, Hollywood, uh, like also TSA stuff. So, um, Amy, the director, has done a lot of work previously, uh, working with and exploring uh, like institution in what I would call institutional abuse. I would say um, she's done done other documentaries about other crime things as well. Not only work, but um, anyways. Evan Rachel Wood made a documentary talking about basically her experience deciding whether or not to name Manson publicly as her abuser. The process of getting the Phoenix Act uh, proposed to the state of California and the whole process behind that was really interesting. Some highlights, I guess, I don't really call them highlights, but she definitely, like, she talks about Manson in the first part. I don't think there's a way you can watch it if you didn't watch it for the Sundance Film Festival screening. And I know from other people, and this is why I didn't make a YouTube video on it, I know other people that have covered it from a different perspective than mine do have their videos of it removed because it is not technically fully released. It was just part one for the film fest festival because it's going to be a two-part, like, mini series for hbo when it's actually finished and um there's definitely some new accusations in there some new details we hadn't heard previously and they do show a clip from groupie in there fyi if you decide to uh watch that which it's literally two seconds it's like but it's it sounds like a horror movie. Like, I don't know if they edited it in post or, like, what the fuck happened. But it sounds like the kind of, like, the, the you can you see a, a second of what is allegedly the groupie tape. And it's, like, basically almost a black screen. And then, like, a woman crying like she's being murdered. Like, I don't know how to describe it besides that. That's what it fucking sounds like. I've been in BDSM dungeons where people are doing some pretty fucking intense shit. I've heard stories i've watched people do 
like fucking the bloodletting from people's genitals before and i have never heard anyone scream from consensual pain in the way that i heard that woman scream it, it just it fucking hit different and maybe it was acting it could you know we don't know we haven't seen the tape right but like that part of the of the documentary like I was excited because I was like, oh, my God, this means they have a copy of the tape maybe to provide for the legal cases. That way the judge can review them and they can determine whether or not they're going to be submitted to evidence, which I think is like necessary part of the process. Right. But it was really intense. That part was really intense. Um, Evan also talks about her experience filming. I forgot the name of the because I want to say if I was your vampire, but it's not the music video. It's the. um, um. Oh, I know, because one of those songs that has, like, the parentheses for the title, where it's, like, um, is it just called Heart Shaped Glasses? Is that the actual name of it? Which I wonder if it's still up, actually. I've just decided to search for this on, uh, on, uh, YouTube. Because I think it's just called Heart Shaped Glasses. Oh, yeah, it's When the Heart Guides the Hand. It's still on fucking YouTube. Has 32 million views. And allegedly, according to Evan Rachel in this documentary, uh... Confirmed that the long-held fan rumors of it being actual sex happening on camera is true. Only it was coerced consent. So whether you want to call that sex or not is, you know. So some new allegations, some new details. I thought it was really well done. I'm sure people are going to have all kinds of problems with it for a million reasons. Say they were doing it for money, even though all of this documentary maker's previous movies didn't gross higher than three hundred thousand dollars even though they i think one of them won an academy award so you know anyways i'm not gonna talk about that really in like a formal manson video until we get to part two being released eventually if that feels like appropriate and like a good thing to do but you know it's legal cases take a long ass time this manson thing's gonna be going on unless everything gets thrown out of court for some reason it's or gets settled out of court for that matter either like things are gonna be in court for the next probably like two years at least because California is slow as molasses. It's so slow. Yeah, heart shaped glasses. I was never really a huge fan of Manson. I feel like I'm like, I gotta get through all the different, all the different people that have been accused of like shitty, shitty things. So Manson update probably... I, unless something really big happens, I'm probably not going to do another video on that until at least March, just because, like, nothing is really happening, one, and two, just because I feel like it's good to have, like, a, a break. What I'm curious about is Army Hammer, because, like, that has been, like, basically, he, like, he got accused of a bunch of shit, then Gloria Allred took the case of, like, his main accuser that wanted to actually file legal charges against him, he got dropped from, like, every movie he had filmed for the last, like, two years. Went into rehab in, not Barbados, but, like, some some country that he had been staying in for a, a long time. And, uh, you know, I think he's, there are people who have met because I think he was in a poster for, like, Death on the Nile, which is, like, probably a movie that's going to flop super hard. So, like, I don't really give a shit. But I don't really know what's going to happen. I don't know if, like... They're actually going to file charges. Like, what's happening with that? I have no idea. But, anyway. So, Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon. What are we going to do about good old Joshy Josh boy? <laughs> so, I debated on making a video about this. And I decided not to. Because there's not really a lot of information to go off of. But there is an article that came out. I'm going to pull it up because I might want to actually quote from this because I'm a professional. So let me pull it up. So Joss Whedon, if you don't know who he is, he is... <sighs> I was going to say something about his face. I'm going to say that maybe at the end if I'm getting real heated. But I have stereotypical feelings about the way that Joss Whedon looks. Anyways, he's most well known for Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and he, he also, he took over the end, was it Justice League? One of those movies that he, he basically took over the, the director work that was remaining slash was serendipitously replaced 
or well he wasn't replaced he replaced um Zack Snyder because Zack Snyder had a really awful family tragedy that happened very understandable left to go be with his family I think that was the right decision to make um but Joss Whedon had an article that was written about him slash with him came out I want to say last week week and a half ago came out in Vulture and it's called The Undoing of Joss Whedon and I was a fan of Buffy. I didn't watch it growing up, but I watched it later as an adult. And I I never liked Firefly. I watched, like, I think two episodes of it. And, I, like, right away it gave me bad vibes. Like, the, the first fucking thing that happens in Firefly is there's, like, a nude teenager that has to be saved. And then there's, like, the, 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 just the, the, the fact that it's oh, just the, the racism in it. The... the attempt at representation that's like we're supposed to believe all these characters are a a mix of um chinese and american and the one character that looks vaguely the most asian wears fucking chopsticks in her hair which would be the same as if we wore forks as uh hair doodads which most of us don't although people do make rings out of spoons so you know Maybe it's not too far off, but I don't know. It was just kind of like, I always thought Firefly was cringe, but I did like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. However, in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, this was something my roommate that showed me this, that showed me the TV series was like adamantly very mad about. And I'm glad that she pointed it out to me because if she didn't, I probably would have missed it because I would not have thought this was like something people would do in a TV show, but they did. So in one of the very early seasons of Buffy, Xander, who's like, the part of the main trio friend group he's like the normie dude he's like the normie dude that's hanging out with the super cool hot magical chicks and the supernatural and is kind of the audience stand-in but is really the stand-in for joss whedon that's really what xander is there for as as character there is an episode where i want to say he gets possessed by a were hyena and he commits a sexual assault against Buffy where basically it is explained away as being because he is under the influence of being possessed still so he wasn't able to control himself however it was revealed later by the older male character that sort of they're all of their guides right but in particular is sort of like Buffy's pseudo dad figure right um basically is like you weren't really still possessed then were you when that happened and it's like no so anyways he wrote um a questionable dubious consent slash essay situation into one of the very early shows that he ever wrote uh it appears that his self-insert character as is often the case was not so far off from his actual truth which was really, uh, yo, that's such a good description, Nathan. I found Joss Whedon to be an archetypal frat nerd. That is such a good description for him. I didn't realize this until, because I don't really, I am not somebody that ever, like, cared about Joss Whedon as, like, a creator. Um, I like Buffy, but Buffy doesn't work unless you have all of the characters in there. It's not special because of him. It's special because of, like, the fact that you know there's this this group of people but anyways um yeah so this is this is people are like oh joss was like this nerd he was misunderstood he grew up in new york city in the upper west side um he was a third generation tv writer his dad was a screenwriter writer for alice and the golden girls and and his grandfather wrote for uh the donna reed show and the dick van van dyke show so both like two generations before him were famous writers that allowed him to get into the door very early on in his career to eventually becoming a writer and you know a showrunner in his own right eventually later on so um he tells us like sad little sob story about himself where he's like i am i was you know i was a dorky nerd and no girls liked me and um you know i was always rejected by women and it just gave him a complex right but like meanwhile he's like just I don't want to imply anything was easy for him because I don't necessarily know his, like, I wasn't fucking there, right? I don't know his personal journey. But it's, like, it wasn't like he was, he grew up in, like, 
the middle of nowhere in Georgia and then was like plucked from obscurity just because he got really lucky because he got an internship at a local news station and that kind of, you know, whatever, right? It wasn't like he got his foot in the door. Like he had the, the doors were fucking open for him as as far as eventually being able to get to the status that uh, he, he has today. I remember that episode, he eats the principal. Oh my God, you're right, I forgot about that. It's It's been like probably seven years since i've seen that episode because why would i want to watch that one again honestly it's kind of gross yeah so funny says most people i know hate xander i feel sad for xander but in like the kind of way right like i know like all oh suck to suck it is funny because like there's, there's characters in media that are like xander like there's sokka right and like avatar the last airbender but the way that sokka works is like sokka eventually comes into his own and finds his own security and finds his own like sense of self and purpose and i, I haven't watched all of buffy but like, i feel like xander never like gets there like he just doesn't he doesn't grow the way that sokka eventually grows right and like ends up because i think sock eventually ends up becoming this like really like famous inventor and stuff and so like he obviously ends up succeeding and i feel like xander just kind of ends up i don't know riding along everyone else's coattails basically so joss whedon allegations you may know not just firefly not just Fi not just buffy not just filling in for director positions for big famous movies he also had a smaller show called dollhouse this is where we get into the tying into the kind of content that i make so i'm about to tell you a story because this is like the paragraphs are back to back one is about working on dollhouse as a set and one is about a costume design involving buffy so even people who didn't worship him told me working with him could be a wonderful experience. Miracle Lori, an actress on Ween's 2009 series Dollhouse, was a size 12 when she got the job. For reference, I'm a size 0. So like a 12 is like, I would call a 12 a medium. Like a, like that's like a, that's like a mid-size girl to me. Like that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being any size of human person. People are just really bad and like if you're not in the u.s i guess like sizing could be different like i think a 12 is like a just very normal it's just the average fucking size right i think i think the average size w woman in america is a size 12 super super normal right not in any way something that like is in any in any way like should be like oh <laughs> you're fat right well we even told her not to go on a diet he was trying to show that a size 12 woman is normal sexy beautiful strong he said I still get people coming up to me to say how much it meant to them. I feel celebrated by him. Like many interviewed, she was surprised to hear that her colleagues felt differently. But looking back, she remembered glimpsing another side of Whedon. I saw his kindness and his good intentions, she said. And I also saw the snarkiness, the fickleness, where I would not want to be on the other side. So, on the one hand, he has someone that he chooses on purpose to be in his show that is a size 12 because he wants to show that size 12 can be beautiful, right? There's a writer that he works with that he doesn't see for a while. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and find the story. <sighs> they were soon joined by Charisma Carpenter, who played Cordelia on Buffy and its spinoff series Angel. In a long Twitter post, she wrote that Whedon had a history of being casually cruel. After she became pregnant, heading into Angel's fourth season, Whedon called her fat to colleagues and summoned her into his office to ask, as she recalled, if she was going to keep it. Size 12 is beautiful and amazing and wonderful. You're pregnant, you're fat, you're awful, I'm going to fight you for my show. What a wonderful feminist he is, isn't he? We love a little reproductive coercion from bosses. It's super great behavior. <laughs> super great behavior. Uh, like, I know that... Um, so Joss Whedon gives me really hardcore, like, shitty teenage atheist vibes. You know? Like, the kind of guy that, like, 
it's not just like I'm an atheist and I'm just like laughing about it. Like, like somebody that fucking like cannot let go of Richard, Richard Dawkins. Like somebody that is like, I hate religion and I hate religious people and they make me angry. Because Charisma Carpenter was a religious person. I'm sh- sure she is still now. Um, and basically, um, he made fun of her for being religious and her religious beliefs informing her decision to not get an abortion and it was just really shitty right um charisma carpenter claimed he had mocked mocked her religious beliefs accused her of sabotaging the show fired her a season later when she had given birth i don't know if this was the case at the time but at least where i live employment discrimination if you become pregnant is against the law so cool stuff there all the joy of new motherhood had been sucked out she wrote and joss was the vampire oh sarah michelle geller tweeted that she wanted to be attached to buffy but still wants nothing to do with whedon i think that's perfect i think that's the same thing as like the harry potter cast in large part like that's how they want to do it where it's like harry potter is their movie and like fuck jk rowling i feel like sure uh, sarah michelle geller all the other like main actors and actresses on that show that gets to be their show i don't give a shit about joss okay worshiping people creating products is weird for example like firefly and jane no adam baldwin is a conservative crackpot i mean i think that's really something that seems to happen a lot is like there's an era we live in where people get really attached to like identifying with a certain like franchise or product where they're like i'm a nintendo fanboy i'm a pokemon nerd i'm um it's really a lot of like nintendo products actually um or star wars right that's another really big one they get really attached to like identifying with a product to the point where they kind of lose their ability to be critical or take criticism from other people about the series right like i could say in the vicinity of somebody that's a nintendo slash pokemon fanboy and be like you know, I really used to like the Pokemon series, but I feel like the shtick they had for the original game just got repeated too many times and I stopped enjoying playing them as much, which is true. And, um, yeah, anyways, um, it's something I feel like is really unhealthy because you have to be able to critically engage with the things that you are consuming, not actively all the time, right? Like you can sit and just enjoy something, but I feel like, it's important to be able to hear something is bad and be able to be like, ah, that's not personally about me. That's about this thing. And just because I like the thing doesn't mean I'm also bad, right? All right, car outside. Thanks for that. I did. I love Willow and Spike, honestly. I have to wonder though, this is my theory about Spike. I have a Spike theory for you all. Um, so Joss, Xander is his stand-in, right? That, that's, that's Joss, right? He writes a super hot, sexy, evil vampire character that is the antithesis to everything he is in every way, right? In terms of looks. He's tall. He has, like, the jaws carved by God personally, like, fucking made from glass, right? He has this really spiky, uh, like, dyed, uh, bleached blonde hair, um you know he's very suave you know all of that stuff right representing everything that joss is not in a character joss had every plan to kill spike off spike was not supposed to be on the show for very long right but the fans loved spike (laughs) the fans loved spike so they had to keep spike and i feel like that was a fucking thorn in joss's side for the rest of the duration of the show because he basically wrote in a chad character as an incel and he can't kill off the chad (laughs) that's his that's his philosophy right oh yeah you know i will say i I like buffy as a tv show my problem isn't with like how buffy was made or anything it's just with joss personally i think having buffy as a show like showing powerful women showing like stereotypical girly teenage girls still being powerful and going through really tough situations i think is really wonderful and amazing but that property can exist 
besides him, right? Like the show, critique of the show, critique of Joss, unless it's something where it's like, this is clearly a stand in that's very personal, like, and connected to him in some way, in which case then it is obviously about him, right? Drusilla, of course, although I don't think Joss had any sort of personal, like, identity relationship with Drusilla, um, but we love Drusilla. Yeah, he actually took out his frustrations of Spike's popularity on James. Exactly. Because he never got over the teenage feelings he had about being inferior, being this nerd. Women don't like him. It's all the Chad's fault, right? It's all the hot boy's fault. <sighs> I don't know. Yeah, why isn't my mod not taking care of the obvious spam chat? would like to be able to Maybe, maybe he was, who knows with him. Okay, so, um, getting, getting back to the story here. I just noticed this. I just noticed this. So, um, <laughs> I don't remember reading this originally when I went through this article. Um, it wasn't just scholars who worshipped him these days, him being Joss Whedon. Uh, Joss was a celebrity showrunner before anyone cared who ran shows. In 2005, the comic book artist Scott R. Kurtz desi designed a t-shirt that gestured at Whedon's stature in popular culture at the time. Joss Whedon is my master now. <laughs> was the shirt. Amazing. Can you just imagine a 14-year-old girl wearing that shirt? Buying it at a convention because she loves Buffy and therefore loves that Joss made that t-shirt for her? I just, yeah, he also was like a super, just a super bad womanizer. So in 2017, his ex-wife, Kai Cole, published a sensational open letter about him on the movie blog, The Rap. She condemned him as a hypocrite preaching feminist ideals and accused him of cheating on her throughout their marriage, including with actresses on the set of Buffy. Then, beginning in the summer of 2020, the actors Ray Fisher and Gal Gadot, who had starred in a superhero film directed by Joss Whedon, claimed he'd mistreated them with Fisher describing his behavior as gross, abusive, unprofessional, and completely unacceptable. Love to see it. So, yeah, he's well known as like a, and he's, he's cop to that. Like, he said that like, he was a cheater. He said that he was a womanizer. Like, he hasn't denied or said those accusations are false. He's like, yeah. I just had to have sex with them, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. So let me find that quote in here. Ah, here we go. Painting a scene. On our second day of interviews, I asked Whedon about his affairs on the set of Buffy. He looked worse than he had the day before. His eyes were faintly bloodshot. He hadn't slept well. I feel fucking terrible about them, he said. When I pressed him on why, he noted, it messes up the power dynamic. But he didn't expand on, what, on that thought. Instead, he quickly added that he had felt he had to sleep with them. That he was powerless to resist. <laughs> Again, the very the young women that were on, on set with him making Buffy. The like I think uh, Charisma Carpenter may have been the oldest thing, she was like twenty five. Um they weren't like I don't think they were actually teenagers when I started filming, but like they were ten plus years at minimum younger than he was. And also he was their boss. <sighs> he was powerless to resist, I laughed. I'm actually not joking, he said. He had been surrounded by beautiful young women, the sort of woman who had ignored him when he was younger, and he feared if he didn't have sex with them, he would always regret it. 
Looking back, he feels shame and horror, he said. I thought of something he had told me earlier. A vampire, he'd said, is the exalted outsider. A creature that feels like less than everybody else, and also kind of more than everybody else. There is this insecurity and arrogance. They do a little dance. Buffy ended in 2003, but his affairs did not. He slept with employees, fans, and colleagues. Eventually, his wife found out. In 2012, they split up. In Cole's open letter to fans, she accused him of using feminism as a cover for his infidelities. He always had a lot of female friends, but he told me it was just because his mother raised him as a feminist, so he just liked women better. Yep. So, it just gets, it just gets more cringeworthy. Uh, being a nerd in high school that has, like, well-to-do family members does not mean that you then, 10 plus years later, get to say, well, you know, I was a nerd a decade ago and women in high school and I was 15 didn't like me. And so, like, I have to sleep with you because if I don't. I will never be able to shut down the quiet, insecure part of myself that tells me that everyone hates me. Women do not exist to fix your insecurity problems. Your coworkers, the young women you have hired to work for you, do not exist to make you feel better about your damn self. Okay. I just feel like it's not like, like when you're that, maybe, maybe he just couldn't get over it. Cause I feel like this happens so often that maybe people can't, maybe people can't get past it. Maybe people just don't always have the ability to work through their problems and get past that developmental stage where they have felt that like harm happen. They're like being rejected a lot and they just, I guess they can't get over it. They're just like. I'm always going to have that hurt, rejected part of myself, and I will do nothing to work with that part and, and help it be healed. I'm just going to let that fester and let it make bad decisions for me in my life, you know? Speaking kind of more of like an IFS sense, not really in like a, you know, I don't know what other sense I could mean that in. But like, if you know parts work, if you know IFS from like, like psychology, that's what I'm talking about. Like, some people, I guess, are just not able to work through that. And then like fucks up their life because they have this thing that's always like, do this thing even though it's bad because it makes me feel better right and not thinking about the consequences for their actions and like there's a lot of people that are in hollywood or like people like louis ck right where he just had a lot of yes men around him who either had a strong suspicion or just outright knew what was going on and stayed silent and ensured other people would stay silent because, oh, well, he's this big famous person, right? There's this incentive all the way down to kind of just keep things at hushed whispers and never really confront anybody about what they're doing, you know? Until it comes out 10 years later that it all happened and then it was gross and awful and the damage is done at that point, right? Um, yeah, I will say... Um, I am not trying to say that what Joss did with the, the women he was having sex with on set was non-consensual. It's not said in this article whether those acts were non-consensual or not. That doesn't matter to me, though. Because problem is, he was cheating on his wife constantly for years, even though he was espousing these so-called feminist values everywhere else. Big old hypocrite. And he was exploiting the power different Different... Power... Why can't it differential just the power imbalance between him and co-workers and women he had hired that he was much older than that he had much more experience than and that would have had reason to believe that because he acted so like mean in other places in their professional relationship if they said no then may have meant very bad things for their reputation for their ability to work in the industry so on and so forth so definitely coercive elements to that that he felt perfectly fine exploiting as long as he could justify it to himself in this sort of like, I earned this. I deserve doing this because I've gotten to a place in my life now where I can make women not say no to me because I'm powerful and cool now. And it's like, 
Have you just thought of hobbies? Like, have you thought of finding fulfillment for yourself outside of, like, the women you have sex with? Because you know, life is more than banging the youngest woman you legally can. Like, I don't maybe this is my ace brain and I'm missing something, but I feel like if your value, if the thing that you need in life to feel okay is to, like, push younger women into having sex with you, your life doesn't sound very good to me. I don't know. Was it Michelle underage though? Um, I don't know um, the specifics of the individual like women that he would have slept with on set. It wouldn't surprise me if they were women that were above the age of consent, but were below the age of majority. Cause that's definitely the kind of thing that creepy dudes will be like, oh, well you're only 17, but legally you could have sex when you're 17. So we're good to go, right? So, um, the final thing with Joss Whedon, sorry, I had to, like, get through all that because there's just, like, so much stuff that happened that, like, I feel like I have to have that preamble of everything else before I get into the specific doll-related stuff. So, this is gonna, this is just, like, this is at the end of the article, and I was, like, what the, what the heck? Oh, I forgot to get, this is, okay, this, this is the last thing that we need before the doll story because it'll all tie together, I promise. Okay. Buffy costume designer Cynthia Bergstrom recalled an incident that happened during the filming of season five. In one episode, Spike asked a sadistic science nerd to create a sex robot version of the Slayer. Whedon and Geller did not agree on the Buffy what the Buffy bot should wear. Sarah was adamant about it being a certain way, Bergstrom said. The costume she wanted was a bit grandma-ish, a pleated skirt and a high neck. He definitely wanted it to be sexier. One day, Geller tried on the different options. Whedon grew frustrated. I was like, Jaws, let's just get her dressed, Bergstrom recalled. He grabbed my arm and dug in his fingernails imp until his fingernails imprinted into my skin, and I said, you're hurting me. So uh, he writes an episode of a TV show um, where he has a sex robot version made um, of Buffy because why not have that be a plot line? That couldn't possibly be connected to any level of personal interest he might have, could it? I couldn't, that couldn't possibly be connected to anything else. No, of course not. Oh my gosh. <sighs> so. Final part, the grand finale of the Joss Whedon What the Fuck series uh, dollhouse. When Arden Lay met Whedon in 2012, she was a sex educator in her 20s and the author of The New Rules of Attraction, a pick -up, a book about being a female pickup artist. Don't necessarily have good opinions about Lay, but irrespective, this is what happens. She picked him up at a club. I love the fact that Joss Whedon got picked up at a club by a female pickup artist. I love that. I don't know why, I just love that as like a part of this plot line. After the second date, Whedon sent her DVDs of Dollhouse. The heroine, played by Buffy alum Eliza uh, Dush Dushku, who I believe is the same one that played Drusilla or Faith. I can't, I get, I'm sorry, let me. I remember I looked this up earlier. I think it's Faith, actually. Oh, uh, yes, it's Faith. Yes, faith. Has no friends, no family, and no personality. A seeker corporation has used advanced technology to erase her memory and turn her into a doll. A living robot. Robot. Sexy robot. Customized to cater to the darkest desires of the company's wealthy clients. Some critics argued the premise was sexist, but Lay, who'd worked as a professional dominatrix, related to the dolls and was moved by Whedon's depiction of them. She and Whedon began a relationship as owner and doll. Doesn't necessarily say who was the owner and who was the doll, although I think the assumption is that Joss was the owner and that she was the doll, because even when you are a pro-dom, you can be submissive in your personal life. That is not new news, I hope, for anyone. It is the thing that happens. For the most part, she found it gratifying, and she believed he did, too. So anyways, 
not saying he has a fetish, but he certainly has a particular interest in um, turning women into robot dolls that he can program to do what they want. <laughs> Whedon told Leigh he identified with the character in Dollhouse. Topher, the nerdy scientist who imprints the dolls with their personalities. Like the creepy sadist scientist that also makes the Buffy doll? Could it be that? Could it be related? Could this be connected? Science has yet to decide. Every time I read this, I just go, really? It's not a flattering comparison. As one of Topher's colleagues points out, he was picked to work at the dollhouse because he had no morals. You had always thought of people as playthings. You always take good care of your toys. That last line is disingenuous. Topher doesn't take good care of his dolls in the show. And in the end, according to Leigh, neither did Whedon. On Dollhouse, she reminds me, bad dolls are banished to the addict. A room of ad addict, not addict. A room where they are forced to relive their worst nightmares over and over. In her epilogue to the new rules of attraction, Leigh wrote that one of her worst memories was of a boyfriend breaking up with her on her birthday. The book came out before she met Joss, just to be clear. Whedon then read the book and they talked about the epilogue. In 2015, hours before her birthday, he came over to her house and told her their relationship was over. If he was like, what could I do to Arden? That would be her worst nightmare. That would have been it, she said. Joss destroyed a beautiful thing just to show he had the power to. That's literally everything you need to know about him. Self-report. It's a self-report. He reported his damn self. Reported his damn self watching that show. Writing the show. He stole the worst nightmare from Philip K. Dick, I bet. I mean, we're assuming that Joss has original ideas, which is... Even, I feel like the Buffy, this is my hot take. I feel like Buffy was a one-trick pony. I feel like after that, he just had, like, the style he applies to everything he does. Like, suddenly, after Joss gets its hands into his, into his show, right, everything becomes, like, a little bit twee um, stuff, thingy, being part of the dialogue, and having sort of, like, this very particular sense of humor, even when it doesn't congrue with the franchise right like just sort of doing it because that's his style you know mm. a fetishistic premise and definitely prostitute Okay. Which is an issue. The first few episodes were awful, but I still solicit that Dollhouse is worthwhile, even if Topher is a skis, totally. Um, I think you can consume whatever media you want to consume. This is not a, like, cancellation, never watch anything he's ever made ever again. Don't think that. However, I think it is interesting to look at that show and know that a lot of that premise might be his own interest. Like, coming to light in a show and those things might not necessarily be consensual right Topher is 1000% the most evil character in that show I mean sounds like it like you gotta you gotta be a particular kind of person to be like I like programming people and then torturing them <laughs> non-consensually <laughs> Not as part of an informed relationship, you know? 
If you have a mind control slash robot robotization kink, it's a show way there for you. But if you don't, there's better explorations of the same things. <laughs> Can we summon all the Josses to the Josh fight to handle this particular Joss? Well, actually, so it's Joss, like J-O-S-S. -S. So I don't know um, how many Josses would show up. He has kind of a special but unique name, I feel like. I've never heard anyone else named Joss. And I sure hope no one is naming their sons after this man because, whew, that is quite the namesake. Okay, this is weird. Um, so according to the dictionary, a Joss is a Chinese religious statue or idol. <laughs> is that why Firefly is the way that it is? It's a name. Okay. Yeah, there's like a couple of famous people that are born with that name. Not a, it's not very popular, though. It's a, it's a last name as well. It can be a surname. All right, so we probably wouldn't have very many people to fight him if we wanted to. <laughs> we wanted to get a fight club for Joss's starting. <laughs> Spike stolen almost wholesale from the Splatterpunk story, The Light at the End of the Tunnel. I mean... Joss wasn't writing a self-insert character or a fantasy, so I wouldn't be surprised if he had to take ideas for Spike from somewhere else <laughs> to create the ultimate hot alpha Chad. <laughs> oh, I should be clear about this. Yeah, doll fetishes are fine as long as you can do it in a non-skeezy way. I... I know! I think his name is Josh, too, and I, I have to... I have to very on purpose be like, Jo jo like not say Josh like and tried not to put an H sound at the end it's very difficult though he could sell his Firefly franchise and somebody could come up with a different create a different ship and a different problem with the Reavers and Central Systems I mean I think there's always a possibility for a, like a, the core of a world to be interesting and then just I just want him to do it in a way or somebody to do it in a way um that just makes me cringe cringe less like i don't feel that show aged well from my limited viewing of it oh uh, we are talking about uh just whedon for the time being not necessarily all night but for right now yeah i don't so getting back to this i want to be clear i don't think Anything with dollification or, like, robot kinks. I don't think any of that is bad. Like, I totally get that kink. I totally... It, it's very in line with, like, something that would appeal to me even though it doesn't appeal to me. I get why that kink exists on both sides of the spectrum. I get it. However, 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 the problem is when you develop that kind of relationship and then you don't have a healthy consensual way of engaging in it like you devise a very non-consent non-consensually sadistic way to like hurt your partner on their birthday by timing that breakup based on previous trauma they had from another breakup if that's actually what happened that is just simply the allegations could be pure coincidence right maybe he's not that smart maybe he doesn't remember who knows um but <clears throat> You have to be mindful about the kinks you engage in. That is always ultimately the point that I try to make is basically almost any kink in certain circumstances is understandable, right? Is something I think is like, oh, I can understand why you engage in that. But you have to be thoughtful about why you're engaging in it. Because I think a lot of times people don't know why they engage in something and they don't have the introspection to tell what their own mental background behind those kinks are. And when you don't have that, it can mean that you hurt yourself and it means you hurt other people around you, right? So the kinks themselves aren't the problem. It's that it's one, it's really funny that he snuck in a personal fetish as the entire premise for a show. And two, that it was confirmed in an interview that he had a relationship based on said fetish that ended really badly. Like, I find that fascinating that it happened because I think we've all had, like, suspicions about certain things, right? Obviously, the Quentin Tarantino is a foot fetishist, right? You know, that kind of a thing. Whereas, it's not very common to get that confirmed, or at least, 
addressed directly by someone else in an interview. I find that fascinating. The Duchess is like, yep, the man loves women being dolls, and he doesn't care if it's consensual or not. That's just how he likes things. I don't think the dollhouse show is very popular. I don't think it got very many seasons. I'm the victim here is the best he could do. I mean, basically, that's what it ends up being is he goes, well, you see, I truly am the one because I was hurt by society first. And so if only society didn't hurt me, then I wouldn't have had to abuse my my power over all these women that were on things that I was the boss of. Gee, won't somebody feel bad for me? <laughs> won't somebody play the Chinese violin? Benefan, this is a nice Friday night. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. I appreciate it. I know we've been talking about Joss for a while. And we've been doing this for like an hour already somehow. Time just flies. I'm like so tired. I feel like I'm coming across as energetic, but I promise you I am dying. Probably gonna have some hot chocolate and work out and then go the fuck to sleep. TBH. That's gonna be my night. It's gonna be really exciting. I was sick, um, like probably a month ago maybe longer ago than that maybe it was before christmas actually um and like that just like knocked me out for like a couple of weeks like actively being sick and then ever since then i've been like i've kind of been bouncing back and forth and having a lot of energy again and feeling really productive and not having any energy and it's like really annoying because i i like working on long projects i love sitting down and editing a really big video and having like especially the ones that i've been doing recently where there's all this research and data and things i'm coding from like i find that very fun to do but it also takes so much time <laughs> it's very time consuming yeah i got some really good i got like a syrup to put in my hot chocolate that's like it's like a peppermint vanilla mint thing and it's really good thoughts on vacuum beds i think vacuum beds are i've been in one a couple times and they're pretty interesting i can see why people like the sensation i don't like things that are cold and when latex isn't like warm it's which is is very usually the case i take off my shoes by the way um i don't like it because of that but then latex also gets really hot really fast and so i don't know i just i like latex all right i like the look of latex i just it's never going to be my favorite thing because i'm too temperature sensitive you know maybe if i could wear it outside you know like if it was a vac bed outside in the summer at nighttime maybe that would be better maybe i'd like it more then hmm i think saran wrap is fun I think I prefer, I prefer saran wrap, honestly, over latex, and it's cheaper. <laughs> and most people aren't allergic to it, which is great. That's really the key bonus, is not having to worry about uh, people's allergies. Where did my pop-out chat go? Well, thank you for being here, uh, Zulma. I'm glad you could make it, and uh, have a good night. Gonna be 50 for the high tomorrow and the low of 28 here in this part of Florida. Crazy weather. Listen, that sounds rough. I think, what are we dealing with here? We're like similar weather, but it's like high of 50, low of 42 kind of a scenario. Let me see. Yeah, it's high of 50, low of 32. Oh, we might get snow next Tuesday. What the heck? Okay, never mind then. Might be getting colder actually. We had like an inversion sh zone here like a couple of days ago, early this week. It was like dangerous to go outside. It was not, the air quality was not, not vibing. <laughs> I heard a vacuum bed and I thought like a Roomba bed. I mean, if you had four Roombas, you could probably set up something where you could have somebody like drug around by the Roomba you know like having the Roomba drag someone behind them <laughs> like some kind of medieval torture device
An acquaintance built a vacuum cube a few years ago where the occupant would end up suspended inside the frame. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen those before. They had one at Kingfest like a couple years ago. And it looks really cool. I've never been in one, though. Cat bedroom, but exactly. I don't have a cat. I don't think Bandit would tolerate it. It would probably freak her out. <laughs> but maybe it would be good. Roombas are pets, but they're robots, and so when does robot consent become a factor? <laughs> when does robot consent become a factor? Uh, I'm not going to make a Joss video. This is going to kind of be my piece on it, just simply because it's like this article is the information. <laughs> like there's not anything else out there besides speculation about like him being into his doll king thing, the actual like story of that relationship, like all that stuff, like what is out there is in that article. So I don't really have anything else to add besides that. So this is kind of, kind of be it, you know? <laughs> when they're self-aware. If Roombas become self-aware, uh, they're gonna not be cleaning on our floors for very long. <laughs> oh no, okay. Oh, uh, no. Okay, so I definitely, um, we've been, like, chatting so much, and I love it, but I'm missing, like, all of the beginning questions from, like, before we started talking about Joss. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The, the YouTube doesn't save the chat, like, as I'm going. Like, it kind of just, like, deletes stuff as we go along. So if you, if you had a question from the beginning of the chat, like, please let me know so I can get to it. I will make that a priority. Um, and just, like, re-ask your question. Because now we're just going to move into, like, the Q&A slash, like, following up on the gentle slash soft on video. So just let, letting everyone know, unless other people have questions about the scenario with Mr. Whedon. Um, just want to make sure I'm not missing these questions. Because it happens. Like, YouTube is just like, oh, you don't have to look at your chat from more than 20 minutes ago. What do you mean? And it's like, well, people don't ask me things. I don't want to see the things they ask me. That's what I want. All right, let me see where we're at. Mm, I didn't watch Torchwood, no. So I um I watched Deadwood, but not Torchwood. Mm. Well, I'm glad to see you back, Chris. I do recognize your name. I'm glad that you're here. And definitely, like, long COVID is not fun. I Luckily, I haven't gotten COVID yet that I'm aware of. I feel very lucky in that way. But I'm definitely very afraid of getting long COVID because I know a lot of people where it's just, like, like they're just out, you know. <laughs> Incel game, uh, gamer gator shit. Not exactly feminism compatible. Well, but you see, he learned how to say nice things to women, and so therefore, he can't be an incel. <laughs> I think is his own logic. I see, again, I still feel like you can watch Buffy and his shows and everything. Just, like, be aware that he's was kind of a piece of shit while the show was being made, and then for every year afterwards, he was also a piece of shit. Women probably didn't want to date him because he came across creepy, not because he was a nerd. You might be onto something there, Catherine. You might be onto something there. Uh, it turns out a lot of people will look at something that they can't change about themselves and be like, that's why people don't like me. And it's like, no, we don't like you because you sent dick pics unsolicited to people. Your hairline wasn't the problem. Your height wasn't the problem. The dick pics 
we're the problem. <laughs> like, but then they're like, oh, well, if I was, uh, if, if I was an Alvin Chad with a six pack, you wouldn't mind my dick pics. And like, no, the dick pics still would have been a problem, actually, believe it or not. Uh, as far as I know, Sarah Michelle Geller was the only teen on the show that was actually a teen. I feel like that's actually a good thing, because I think she was the one that he didn't attempt to sleep with. So, good. <laughs> I'm a hypersexual slash autosexual in this type of pansexual with no preference. And this is still all sounds like pure illogical line <laughs> landmine riddled riddle fuckery. Well, I'm glad it's not just my asexuality not being able to comprehend it. Because uh, that does happen from time to time and I gotta check in. But uh, it is a big old can of what the fuck. I'll say that. Sex robot, worst sci-fi trope ever. I feel like, in my humble opinion... Rick and Morty got the last take on the sex robot trope because the sex robot ended up being a baby making robot for a space of very dangerous space aliens. Um, and it turned into like an abstinence thing. Like, I don't know. Um, I feel like I was like, okay, we're done now. We can, we can officially kill and bury the sex robot trope because we took it to its most extreme conclusion. My hair looks cute today. Oh, thank you. I just have it up in like a bun. I don't know. When, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this still. I feel like when I wear it up, it's cute to like have this little bit here. But then when I film videos and my hair is like down and straight, it's like you can see that it's there and like it's like its own piece. I don't know. I'm conflicted. Oh, thank you, M. Try. Okay, I promise. I'm just trying to make sure I haven't missed any questions. Is it Topher? Actually, I didn't... When I say Topher, it makes me want to say Topherky. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Firefly has any fetishes in it that I'm aware of. I didn't watch enough of it to say that with any sort of authority. It could be in there, but I don't think it is. Unless he's fetishizing Asian women in some way. But then he doesn't have any Asian people in the main cast, and so... Somehow China and the U.S. have occupied space, and yet there's no Chinese main characters. How does that happen? Don't know. A writer accidentally outing their kinks through the writing is something I know is reading fanfiction. Oh, yeah. But I feel like with fanfiction, it's fine, because isn't the point of fanfiction to be able to write out your own personal fantasies? Like, that, I get that. But it's just funny to me when it's like, you're a professional showrunner. You right? Was he just waiting until he had enough really good shows under his belt to be like, I can make the fetish thing now? <laughs> was that what it was? He was just like, okay, I've made three shows. I can do whatever I want. The network, the network's giving me money. Um, all right, it's kink time. We're doing it. Kink time. Let's go. That's how I imagine it went for him mentally. Because I think a lot of writers have, like, a particular passion project they always, like, want to work on. But they don't for a long time because it's like, well, this won't really get money. It won't get funding. It won't get picked up by a studio because I'm not well known. It's kind of a weird premise. And so they work on other stuff that's more commercial for a long time to eventually do the dream project. And I guess his dream project was sex, uh, murder robots <laughs> or whatever it is they do in the show. I don't know. Yeah, latex, the thing about it is, like, you're right, it doesn't breathe. And there was one time I wore, um, I wore, like, a, like, a long sleeve latex top. And I had it on to go to an event. And I wore it, like, most of the day. I probably had it on for, like, eight, nine, ten hours, somewhere in there. Because it was, like, it was, like, a whole day, whole day thing. And 
I, I got I broke out in like superficial blackheads like all over my shoulders like right here from wearing it for so long because that's where I was like sweating apparently and because there wasn't like it was just like getting into my skin really bad I don't know it was like it was like my skin was not like happy with it so um I, I don't generally wear latex for super long periods of time because of that just because it like it's not breathable um I wouldn't I don't like the smell of it it isn't like an art of it is an artificial smell for me, the only redeeming quality of latex is the way that it looks. I don't like it, how it feels. I don't like it that it's cold. I don't like the smell. Like, I much, 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 much prefer leather as a clothing item in general. I love my leather dress. I love all the other secondhand leather stuff that I have. It's just way harder to find, and that's, like, the main problem. Mm. robot consent is subject to the jack harkness rule if the robot is sentient enough to make decisions consent must be consulted oh so that's like um like doctor who is he a robot i haven't watched enough doctor who to know that but i'll take your word for it oh okay i've once again i've lost the chat okay let me make sure i'm not missing okay where what was in this okay okay i think i found where i was at okay cool 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 it's not the time is a number of lines what does that mean number of lines oh the number of lines of chat i was like in the thing you meant on my video and i was like well, what does that mean okay i'm gonna turn off my heater give me a second okay know how i want to set him on on focus okay bring him here maybe i don't know i feel like i'm farther away from the camera i don't know this is what always happens when i get up i'm like where was i before i'm gonna stay here i think unless i go out of focus i don't know Okay, so hmm. <laughs> vacuum beds are very interesting. They are really expensive. I mean, latex in general is expensive. So it'll probably be hard to find one that you can get for cheap just to try it. But there are definitely parties you can go to where people will have one if you just want to like try it out. If people have robot fetishes, can they also have Roomba fetishes? Oh, absolutely. I am sure this is cursed and don't look for it. I am sure there is Roomba porn. I don't know. See, now I'm going to focus. Okay, we're moving here. That should work. I don't know. Where's my... Where's my hair? What is my hair doing? All right, I'm just gonna leave that, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but I'm sure there is room for fetishes. Don't look it up though. Um, okay, so Catherine asked, any advice on how to handle a fake slash bad dom who's in your area going to events you go to and has taken an interest in you? He was trying to manipulate me into play cause I'm new. So, It depends on what you mean by bad because if by bad you mean is bad at flogging is kind of awkward using rope etc that's one thing if it's like i have seen him violate consent or heard that he does that slash i 
have reason to believe that he's like violated consent numerous times or whatever else like there's different levels of badness because there's bad like just hasn't had enough practice and there's bad like is like a predator you know um but if you're ever uncomfortable at an event and you don't want to be around him if you haven't i really 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 would speak to the people that are organizing the event unless he's organizing it in which case like that's going to be a bigger problem but if you if you feel uncomfortable when he's around message whoever is coordinating the event and be like hey i'm new i've had xyz experience with this person they make me feel really uncomfortable you know just to let you know right and depending on how the parties you're going to organize like for example in the oldy days when we used to have parties where i lived there would usually be a role that was like the social dm and the social dm's job was to make sure that everyone was interacting socially in a comfortable and just overall good non-predatory fashion and one of the functions of that was like making sure to keep like the very much older super experienced male doms with like away from the people that we knew that were like brand brand new or people that like felt intimidated by somebody else or whatever else like situations where we knew there was maybe like tension or potential conflict or just like somebody didn't want to talk to somebody else and like keeping an eye out for that happening and also just making sure that previously known issues were not um happening again basically but i think um if you tell them that things like feel awkward for you or whatever they can at least know or if you're at the party that's happening right there like talk to a dm and be like hey there's this guy like i don't really want to talk to him but he's like pressuring me into play and he did this thing that made me uncomfortable and i'm i'm not sure if that kind of thing depending on what it is it could be a bannable offense but it might not be but it can also be something where the dms there then know to kind of like intervene and like take him away from conversing with you so that way you still feel comfortable but it is really hard because there is this like there is this spectrum ex that exists of like well you know this person didn't really do anything that's against the rules but there's people there that don't get along with him that don't want to see him slash he always is really aggressive around but like you can't necessarily ban someone for that per se and like yeah it's it's very tricky but if you haven't yet the main thing is to talk to the people that are actually organizing the event and if you feel safe if you have some backup like just really really clearly clearly telling him that like hey i'm really flattered you want to play with me but i'm not interested and just like don't be like um i don't know don't be like i'm not saying you're doing this but just in general for the audience listening right like in general i don't think it's a good idea to beat around the bush with people that you are not going to be into and be like oh well you know maybe next time or sorry not right now oh, blah, blah, blah. like just say like hey sorry i'm not interested like you're better off spending your time somewhere else basically um because i'm sure they don't want to waste their time either um which i mean is sort of like moving the problem to someone else i guess technically potentially you know, maybe there's somebody that would really be into him and want to play you know um but yeah, there's like a whole spectrum of different ways to approach that depending on exactly what the issue is. Uh, I'm only finding gen gentle dom stuff for a woman being the dom, not a man. Um, I definitely found stuff when I was looking online about um, um, soft dom. So the, if you're looking for something that's more gendered, uh, gentle seems to be more correlated with gentle femdom, whereas soft, for some reason, gets to be assigned more often to like masculine tops or masculine or male doms so um if you're having trouble finding stuff for like gentle dom that is for the dom being a man like just maybe change the search term a little bit and you might find some more information but the thing is and i don't think it really emphasizes in the video enough um there's not a lot of information out there honestly about soft dom or gentle fem dom or whatever else in like a very like concrete constructed like very clear answer kind of a way where it's like this is this this is this, how to do this x y b like there's not like a whole like step-by-step -step guide for doing the thing and i think that that is um, something that's just going to happen when you have newer terminology and that's not necessarily always bad but it is something that can happen right so just just be aware of that um i just harder to find information about it i know and somebody put this in a comment i saw it. i know that lex has a or is it l lx lx maybe um whatever her name is she ha i know that she has videos on soft dominance because they came up when i was searching for research for that video 
um she has for unknown reasons to me uh blocked me on all the social media <laughs> that she has I don't know why. I've never had a conversation with her before. Never interacted before. I don't know what happened there. I know that she's blocked other, like, sex and, like, kink content creators. And I I feel like that's just, like, a that's just like a red flag for me. It's like, why are you proactively blocking? I know that she's, a, she's definitely very anti-porn. She's very anti-sex work. She thinks that, like, women need to preserve their um, special vaginas for the right man or their like power gets taken away from them like it's very like oh you think feminism is still when women's pussies are special and there's something unique about them that needs to be preserved otherwise it gets defiled yeah that's, no that's not what that is actually so I'm not a fan of her personally I don't really like ever recommend her content I don't ever use her content as a reference for my own videos um because frankly she tends to make stuff on the same subject i do that just comes out later um and i also don't think she's a lifestyler i don't think that she's like um like in the community if you notice if you look on her channel she's never i know i'm like talking shit right now but just to just because i know it's going to come up with this subject because i think her most popular video is the one that she made on like gentle dominance like she doesn't have any videos on how to find events what to expect at a dungeon how to go to a dungeon what's FetLife, how to use FetLife. Like, there's no information on her channel whatsoever on, like, the real-life BDSM community. And from what I can tell from the stuff of hers that I have seen, because I knew about her channel from, like, her second video. Like, I, I, because I'm constantly looking for new creators and people to recommend and collaborate with. Um, and, like, I think she had a boyfriend, or I don't know if it's the same boyfriend she has now, but she had a boyfriend that she was doing BDSM with, but I don't think she's ever interacted with the real life community, which is interesting <laughs> to me as a as a content creator and educator to be like, I know everything about BDSM and I am a certified sex coach and I know everything there is to know, but I've never actually done BDSM at a dungeon before and da da da, like, you know, it's L-X, it's E-L-L-E-X, the letter X, yeah. She doesn't have a YouTube chat? Wait, what do you mean? Yeah, she's like also a kind of a, I don't know if she's just a swerf. She may also be a turf. I don't know. I haven't seen that yet. Very few things are as uh, decidedly patriarchal as attributing value to a woman's sexual, um, I don't know about incompetence, but maybe performance. After all, only a card shark would want to play with someone who's never played poker before. That is a great way of thinking about it. That's so true. Exactly. It's like, if you are constantly only looking for virgins to have sex with, is it really because you think there's something special about an untouched pussy? Or is it because you're afraid of a woman discovering that other people are better at sex than you? You know? I think she has a live chat going. I know she has comments on her videos, but it was just like, just like super weird. Um, I don't know. Just like, it gives me bad vibes. And so I can't recommend it. It's just weird to me. I don't know. I don't recommend it. Oh my gosh. We only have half an hour left. Time flies when you are ranting about things. Um, I just see they released presenters for Kinkfest. And I didn't see your name. Well, I didn't apply to present. <laughs> So that that would be why I've never been on the list of presenters for Kingfest. Uh, I haven't presented at Kingfest. I'm not planning on going unless something different happens with Omicron in the next like two months. I'm I, as far as I know, they're having an in-person event. They're not doing it online, so I'm not a not planning to physically participate in Kingfest this year. Is tickling considered part of soft dom? Um, I would consider it part of soft dominance, um, but it really depends on the on the individual person. Mr. Beansman donated five dollars. Do you have any advice for approaching prominent members of your community? Mm. There's some people in my community that I feel intimidated to approach. Um, I feel like it's best to treat people, even people that are like bigger members in your local scene as like actual people for a couple of reasons 
one, it might be refreshing to them is like not being treated as a micro celebrity. And two, if they have some kind of very strict regimented way that they need to be talked to and otherwise they get offended, they're a giant asshole that's not worth your time. <laughs> so I feel like it's probably, I know that's like, it's like silly advice, but I think if you could just remember that they're just normal people, even if there are like local micro celebrities, they're like F-less celebrities really out of any kind of celebrity. And if there is a way to approach them in a non-play setting, like at a munch, at a social event, I feel like that might be easier versus when it's in a play setting and they maybe are in like their fancy regalia, they maybe are DMing, they're running the event, something where kind of they are, are in more of a place of like power and authority. I think if there's a way you can talk to them outside of that or even just like um, I don't know how you want to talk to them or why you want to talk to them um, even just sending them like an email or a felt life message that might be easier if you're just trying to like say hi and be like hey I know who you are you know I think there's ways to do it I think there's definitely ways to like introduce yourself and like talk to the people that are like more well known in your community I mean I've never personally really like I've definitely been nervous like talking to certain educators before because they're like nationally known and they have these books and they've always been really really nice they've always been like so humble like just like interesting fun people to have conversations with and not like hmm well you know I'm this local celebrity and you didn't kiss my boots before you said hello to me and so now I'm not gonna talk to you like if they're like that they're not worth your time just remember they're normal people I mean be respectful right but don't be like groveling either like there's just be like act like a normal respectful <laughs> person and whatever conversation is you want to have, be like, hey, my name's so-and-so. I've been going to these events for a while. Um, and then whatever it is you want to say, right? Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Just treat them like normal people. <laughs> oh, beautiful Angel88. You have opened a can of worms with this question. But I don't mean that in a bad way. What are your thoughts on pet slash age regression and how it's accessible to minors. So I have no idea how popular pet regression or whatever the fuck is. I have no idea. Um, I remember that being a thing on Instagram and on Tumblr. But I really disassociated myself from like the online like female centric like pet play community like years ago at this point. Probably three years ago. So I'm not, I'm not really up to speed on like how popular those ideas still are. Or if it's being spread on like TikTok or wherever else. So I don't know about that. Um, I can't speak to how accessible it is to minors. I I was there when it was written. <laughs> I was there. I was a witness to when these terms were made. I remember when they came out and everyone was like, bitch, what the fuck? Like, because um, for a while on Tumblr, ye olde Tumblr history, there was a long standing conflict between people that were into CGL or DDLG and people um that had a uh, disassociative identity disorder did because they both independently use the term little you can't have a little alter in a system which is somebody um that has basically a separate like i don't know if you, personality is the right term or like a persona or a part or whatever somebody that has a part that they can switch to um, that is a younger age than what they are. That's typically like, you know, elementary school, like toddler age, somewhere in there, right? That's referred to as a little, right? Obviously, people who do CGLG or people, yeah. No, just C CGL, not, not CGL, already. That's a different thing. CGL and DDLG, right? The L in it is little. And so they both overlap with the term little, which causes so much fucking tension on Tumblr. Oh my God, people just get so mad about it. It's like, get out of our tags. This is disrupting our tags. They're violating our safe space. And it's like, oh my fucking God, like just, this can't really be that big of a deal. But it is. It just, it just was a really, really, really big deal for some reason. And from that, you had a lot of people that wanted to make age play and pet play safe for work. Because you had a lot of minors that were fucking insisting that it was okay for them to be doing pet play and talking about it and posting about it and sharing stories online and using the same hashtags as the adults. And Dickman donated oh. five dollars. Do you any specific advice for overcoming shyness as oh. a dog? Handling. Oh no. What do they think of me? Feeling. Oh, I do have advice for that. I will finish my rant and then I will get to that question. Advice for shyness as a dog. So, there were minors that were like, 
basically miners invented the term pet regression and safe for work age regression because they wanted to be able to do bdsm stuff without having to call it bdsm right they like the aesthetics they like the toys they like the gear they like the pacifier gags they like the hoods they like the whatever they like being part of a community that had this particular identity like they they liked all of that but because bdsm stuff is 18 plus only they just made their own thing so um minors made the term so it's like that is is like that's why it's accessible to minors is because minors made it um pet regression is not a fucking thing like i'm sorry if there's therians here or like other kin or whatever that maybe have slightly different opinions about this um you know in terms of like past lives or like spiritual connections or whatever but like um you're born as a human you are a human you cannot to you cannot regress to something that you are not and never have been i cannot regress to being a fucking goldfish because i was never a fucking goldfish um and and the reason why it pisses me off is because people like there is no way that there are this many psychiatrists in the united states still practicing age regression hypnotherapy as a regular part of their practice i'm sorry this wasn't this was dead like 20 years ago it's not like it's not that popular now i swear to god um because a lot of people um were basically saying oh well you know i do age regression therapy um, or I'm doing self-directed age regression therapy. And so, you know, it's fine for me to do this. It's not, a, it's not a gross, evil, weird BDSM thing. I'm just doing self-directed age regression as like a therapeutic practice. And yes, my partner puts diapers on me. And yes, my partner is giving me a sippy cup, but it's not a sex thing. It's not a power exchange thing. It's because they're helping me because I'm doing my therapy right now. And like, <laughs> It's amazing the things that people will insist are not BDSM in order to be like, um, actually, this is for my trauma. You cannot criticize me. And it's like, no one that is a practicing therapist would ever recommend you completely undirected with no medical supervision ever do education regression by yourself. Like, that's not a thing. I was, it's not a thing. If you are doing that, you are dealing with a wholly unethical, unethical therapist. Any kind of like, hypno regression stuff like that even if it does happen is not something you should be doing without any kind of medical supervision any kind of oversight or direction from an actual professional like just not a thing it's not a thing um but it was really because people were either minors and they wanted to be able to do bdsm and force their way into it but basically going around this back door and insisting that what they were doing was really bdsm was really not bdsm even though they used all the same terminology, basically the same hashtags, bought gear from the same places, and we're basically getting the same thing out of it, which is fucking, like, so funny to me, because, like, the people that do pet play and age play stuff for BDSM, like, you'll hear a lot of people say, I like this because it helps me relax, it helps with my stress at the end of the day, it helps me clear my mind, and it's the same thing that people that do age regression or whatever, they say the same thing. They're like, oh, it helps me deal with my trauma. It helps me with my stress and my anxiety. It's like, this is the, the same reasons. Like, it's not magically special and different and better because it's not gross, kinky, fetish, BDSM stuff. Like, anyways, I just feel like those terms need to die and not be used anymore. But they're gonna because there's always going to be 15-year-olds that see anime cat girls and are like, I think that's sexy and hot. I want to be an anime cat girl <laughs> with my 17-year-old boyfriend. Like, that's always going to be a thing. It's always going to be a thing. We can't get rid of it. I just, like, wish it wasn't couched in this, like, anti-BDSM, kink bad, fetish bad, like, sex negativity crap. Really, that's what I have a problem with. Anyways, that's my rant. Welcome to my rant. And the end of my rant. Okay, so um, let me move back to the question that we had about being shy as a dom and, like, having those feelings of, like, oh, no. So I get it. It's super hard. Um, I have topped before a couple times, but I'm not a dom. And so when it comes to, like, having confidence in a power exchange relationship, that's not necessarily something that I know about on a personal level. But just know that that's, like, really common. Like, there are very few doms, I think, that just, like, fucking wake up in the morning and are, like, 
it's dom time baby like every day where they just like have the confidence they have the energy they know what they're doing especially at the very very beginning so just know um that's really common i think too like help yourself do not over promise and under deliver <laughs> do not put yourself in a scenario where you are going to tell someone they're like oh yeah i can do this this and this and this and then not have the confidence to be able to execute on all those things i think it's better to like start start small so that way you can build your confidence because that's really the key thing right when it comes to like sort of combating shyness is you need to have confidence in yourself that you can do the thing and you can't do that if you're trying to learn how to do 20 things at once so like start with like one thing that you're like really really into and you want to know how to do really well right that could be bondage that could be spanking that could be flogging that could be like other forms of restraint that aren't bondage that could be humiliation it could be whatever you want right but like focus on like one thing that you can really really develop as a skill and this can kind of backfire sometimes because if you do this in public you can get the stereotype attached to you that you only do that one thing so just be aware of that but if you can really read a lot practice a lot on your own if you can um you know watch tutorials do all that stuff get that confidence doing that thing and and practicing in small ways before you get into doing the more complicated stuff right so just like negotiate with your play partners and i don't think you need to like lie about being new because it's going to sh shoot yourself in the foot ultimately like let people know hey like i'm a newer dom i think i'm really interested in xyz thing i'm really practicing xyz thing can we try doing that i'd love to have like a short scene with you where we like try that out and there are definitely bottoms, definitely people, especially people that might be into you, that are totally willing to like practice with you and give you feedback and have those smaller scenes with someone, especially if you do align with like, you know, maybe you're more strict, maybe you're more kind of like a caregiver type, maybe you're really into like praise stuff, like whatever it is. If you align in those areas for what you want to do, um, that can also really help, right? But as long as you're like doing small things and building that confidence, that'll do a lot. Um, wear clothing that helps you feel powerful. Like, I think it's really important um, to help yourself by doing things that make you feel good so that way you can project out that confidence. Um, you know, think about what you're wearing. Think about, you know, how you dress, your physical appearance, you know, uh, aftershave, cologne, whatever it is, right? Like, find things that make you feel in the zone and connected with your dominant side. Because if you are somebody that's shy in, like, everyday life, wearing your like shy clothes wearing your like cargo pants your hoodies your whatever else like the things maybe you wear that kind of like protect yourself from the world separate yourself from other people like whatever it is like disconnect from that and make yourself something that is like your dom like persona wardrobe or your like dom time clothing a lot of people like suits ties shirts whatever it could literally it could be a kilt it could be fishnets it could be latex it could be literally whatever you want you don't have to go with the stereotype, but it's whatever personally makes you feel more confident and more pow powerful, right? Uh, one of the very, very few things that is somewhat right about pickup artist stuff is body language. In the sense that um, if you yourself are starting with unconfident body language, right? Your like shoulders are really hunched in, you're looking down, you're not making eye contact, like you are setting yourself up like physically to not feel confident in yourself and other people may pick up on that they might not obviously everyone lots of different ability levels with like reading and interpreting interpreting body language especially because we do have a lot of uh non-neurotypical people in the bdsm community so it may not even be a problem but um in any case um when you're dealing with body language and stuff like hold your body in a way where you're like telling yourself this is kind of like a like a like a a CBT but like in the psychology sense not in the BDSM sense like life hack thing like put yourself in a physical position where like you feel comfortable you feel empowered you feel confident right like shoulders back head up making eye contact projecting your voice and I know it's really hard so you can like start small and like focus on trying to do one thing at a time don't try to do it all at once but that can really do a lot if you like tell yourself I am confident, I am being confident, I know that I can do this, I know that I'm educated, and, like, give yourself evidence to tell your brain that that, like, fits the facts, right? You can say, well, I watched these videos, I've done this practice, I've read these things, I've done this, like, because it's really easy for your brain to, like, sabotage yourself and be like, oh my god, like, they're gonna find out that I'm not really good at this, they're gonna, blah, 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 right? If you can tell yourself, well, like, I, they know that I'm new, right? 
I trust them. They understand me. And I have every reason to be confident because I did all the things I could do to like learn how to do this really well. And everything's going to be okay, right? We negotiated. We have a safe word. We have aftercare plans. We have all that stuff we need to have. And the more of those kind of facts you can tell to your brain, the easier it is to overcome the part of your brain that wants to say like, this is going to be a bad time. This is going to suck. They're going to figure out I don't know what I'm doing and meltdown, explosion, da, 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 da. Um, so if you can avoid that, that will really help a lot. And at the end of the day, it really is just practice. Um, it's very normal to be nervous when you're new at something, right? Like driving. Like for most of us, the first couple times that we were behind the wheel and we were driving, we were doing driving practice, it was fucking nerve wracking, right? It was really, it was really scary. It was like, oh my God, I'm going to hit this thing. I'm going to forget how to do this. This is like all, they've got all these buttons and, and the gas pedal and the brakes and the steering and all the mirrors and oh, it's overwhelming, right? How am I ever going to learn how to do this? Well, obviously, eventually you get your license and you drive and you drive for years and you don't even think about it anymore, right? It's all old hat. Same thing with doing BDSM, same thing with doing power exchange. The more you have practice doing it, the more comfortable it is and the less you worry about all those little tiny details of like, oh my God, I gotta make sure I do this. Gotta remember that. It's just like it happens. It's just so natural for you that you don't even have to like worry about that. You should still be aware. You should still think about what you're doing, but you don't have to be like panicked to be like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing at all, right? Uh, I went to the thrift store and found an oversized pinstripe suit. I shall put, um, um, oh, epaulet, uh, epaulet, so like shoulder, shoulder things. Um, I made a chain mail. That does sound like a look. Don't forget to include your heart in the conversation. Yeah, I think, I think you always, I should be careful. I should, I'm, do not be someone that's not yourself, right? Be a more confident version of yourself. Don't lie. Don't, don't misrepresent what you want. Don't misrepresent your experience. Like say what your feelings are. Say what you genuinely feel about something rather than saying what you think someone else wants to hear. body memory gets in and takes over yeah so you gotta like that's why you gotta like learn to hold yourself a certain way and basically make a body memory that's going to be positive for you so that way you know think about it like this you're forming the neural pathway right now for like how I feel when I'm being a dom don't don't get a, a doomer take about this this is a good thing you can use to your advantage you're forming the neural network in your brain for like dom time so give your brain the information it needs to make that like a healthy, positive neural network with being confident, finding things that make you feel good, dressing up, doing whatever else you need to do in a way that makes you feel good. Make it a positive neural pathway and that will help you going forward. And the more confidence you build off of that, the more information that part of your brain gets and everything gets so much easier. <laughs> everything gets so much easier. That confidence can really kick in after you become more learned, more informed. I'm introverted, but I'm also a dom, and it only comes natural because of established learning. Exactly, yes. Even the people that are in everyday life, super dominant people, very aggressive, very extroverted, they still have to learn the skills of doing BDSM. Nobody wakes up naturally being like, I know how to throw a whip. I know how to throw a flogger. You have to learn those skills, even if you maybe have some advantages in certain areas because you have the confidence, but you can teach yourself the confidence. You can fake the confidence to the point where after enough time it becomes a real confidence. It's not that you're faking it. This isn't the thing. Don't think about it like I'm faking and I'm lying <laughs> because then your brain's going to think I'm not really confident. I'm just tricking people. You are learning how to become confident. You're not lying. You're not faking. You're developing a new skill and a new habit. Everyone has the capacity for confidence. I am so sure about it. I say this as someone that has confidence in some areas and not at all in others. <laughs> I am very unconfident in certain ways and very confident in others. And trust me, you can learn to have confidence. It just takes more time in other areas and less time in other ones. So I think that is going to be my answer for that question. Let me know what you guys think about that because I feel like the confidence in like Dom stuff is very interesting and we don't 
include that i think in conversations about like being a new dom i do have you haven't watched it yet i do have some videos on like being a a new dom with an experienced submissive and like advice for new doms so if you haven't seen those videos yet do check them out because i think they would be helpful if you haven't seen them <laughs> yes you have to practice doming by doming the you're a liar and a fraud voice in your head first Yes, exactly, Nathan. I really see why fashion comes into this now. It's externalizing an internal mindset. That is exactly what it is. It is about, well, it, to some extent, it is projecting to others. And so you have to use like sign and symbols and things that like other people would read as like being confident or powerful or whatever. That's why everyone wears like black and red and purple and stuff in like BDSM spaces. But um, um, some of it is, is, is outward for the sake of other people to interpret you correctly. But it, it, it's more about like, like, I am internally seeking in myself the things that help me feel confident and sexy and amazing and powerful and, and just, you know, like, like myself, right? And, you know, for me, that's, like, big teased up hair and crazy eye makeup and, you know, layers of different black clothing and really big stompy boots or really big high heels with platforms. That is what makes me feel confident. But for the next person, they're going to be into, like, skin tight latex. The next person's going to be into you know, a custom tailored suit. The next person is going to be into, you know, a kilt with a fishnet top, right? It, every single person is going to have their own iteration of like what helps them feel the most like themselves in that confident place. You are your own worst critic and you're all cooler than you think. Exactly. Unless you are Joss Whedon, in which case you've made yourself a damn loser, Joss. That was your own fault. You could have been cool and then you weren't. Um, should a newbie dom look for an experienced sub? Seems reasonable, but they must get sick of training. Um, oh, catch a cover. Um, the purpose of the video is not to tell people that's what they should be doing, but I was getting questions from people that are like, help, I'm a new dom, my submissive is more experienced, like, how can I help them feel submissive, even though they are basically, like, teaching me what to do? Um, and that is a lot of relationships. A lot of people come into... BDSM having relationships where like one person is more experienced than the other that's like really normal and this is just like one version of it because when you are having experienced Dom with a new sub the problems are way different super really 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 different problems there um but I think it can be good like um I wouldn't necessarily say that a new Dom should look for an experienced sub for like a long-term like life relationship but I do think that a new Dom should look for experienced submissives that are willing to help them in certain areas, like in a, in like a tit for tat kind of way where, you know, Hey, I want to practice flogging. Um, like, would you be willing to help me with that? And then like eventually, cause this is what I think of when I'm experienced submissive, um, as an experienced submissive, what I'm thinking of is by helping this new Dom learn what to expect from a scene and help them practice that is paying dividends for the community later because we have like a, another good experience dom or top eventually out of that so i'm super like happy to help with anyone that like wants to like learn those skills um and i think that's like a good thing for experience and missives to offer but like you have to know that it's like practice and not like every single scene that you do right um next topic from the bottom no 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 um people think that um, in which case experienced submissives could never bottom for anyone because then that implies that once you're experienced and you have opinions, that means you can't be submissive anymore, which is like so wrong. Um, no, it's not talking from the bottom um, because talking from the bottom, if it is a thing that happens, if it's something we want to, you know, put stock into, implies that there are submissives that are out there that are like bossing a dom around and being like, no harder no softer and like just being like really rude and not caring about their partner during the scene what i'm talking about is you mutually negotiate for a scene where the more experienced party is going to be giving like feedback and more direct direction with the intention for that to be a learning experience for the top and that being like negotiated on purpose and like an okay thing that's within the boundaries of the relationship not something where it's like non-negotiated like power struggle type shit you know Uh, 
Uh, my bottom helped me um, gain confidence. With exactly. People really do, do downplay the role that an experienced submissive can have in helping teaching people because it's like where else like are people going to learn skills because i mean not to i don't i should be careful with this i i'm not saying that like new people can't help new people i just think the learning process is more efficient and shorter when you have an experienced person helping a newer person not because the experienced person um needs to like indoctrinate the new person into the way that they particularly think about something but it's easier to get feedback and know and kind of work out and like troubleshoot things, right? Because if like, imagine this, you're both new people and you want to try spanking and you try it out for the first time and the scene doesn't go super well and you're trying to figure out why it didn't work, right? It could be a million things. It could be the bottom doesn't like spanking. It could be they don't like spanking on that part of their body. It could be the bottom isn't like spanking with an open hand, but would want it with a hairbrush. It could be because uh, the dom was going too hard, going too soft. Um, you know, they were using their fingers instead of their palm, right? Um, it could be the bottom doesn't like stingy sensations. It could, you know, it could be a million things, right? And when you are an experienced bottom that kind of already knows about something, it's easier to pinpoint like, oh, this is the thing that's making this less fun or less good for me individually. Um, cause there is like, you know, even when you are learning stuff, you are really more learning the person's individual preference and then like practicing the core skill. So if, uh, you have an experienced bottom in that same scenario, um, but they know what their preferences are, they can more accurately state like, Hey, um, this is what happened. This is like, okay, so this is the scene and this went really, really well. And you did a really good job, like hitting on the right spot. This is like, you were really accurate. Um, however, I think if you want to produce like a thuddier sensation, you should hit like more with the palm or you could have spent more time on the same area, whatever else, right? You can get more of that feedback. So it, there's, there's pros and minuses to each one, but I think that experienced submissives, like it's really hard, honestly, because when you're an experienced submissive, like when you are an experienced submissive, new doms are intimidated by you because they're like, oh, she's going to know so much and she's not going to be into, and I'm using gendered language because I'm thinking about my own experience. Um, this, this applies to any submissive. Um, like she's not going to be impressed by me. She won't want to play with me because I'm new, blah, blah, blah. And then when you have an experienced submissive with an experienced dom, a lot of doms and tops get a lot out of like newer submissives they like breaking people in they like showing people what things are like and they kind of sometimes have this idea of like they want to mold people and that if you have too much experience that like you're gonna have too many of your own opinions baked into stuff and they're not going to be able to like shape you which is not healthy and good but it means that for a lot of doms they have a stronger preference for like newer and younger people over older and more experienced Even the best race drivers don't practice laps on the track after all. True, 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 true. Do not be afraid to practice. Even people that are at the top of their game still practice and that is how they stay on the top, right? All right, oh my gosh. We are already like out of time. I <laughs> apparently had a lot of thoughts about that. I'm so sorry. Here, let me go through the chat really quickly and just like maybe answer like one or two more really quick questions. Oh, okay, this is a good one. Uh, Rose asked, what are the ages of people at major dungeons? Are there people in their 20s or is it mostly 30s and up? I'm nervous to go. My only state's major dungeon, but I'm only 21. So I was very much in a similar position as you, Rose, because I got into BDSM when I was 20, just turning 21. And for the most part, um, you see a mix. There are different events for different groups of people and different dungeons are organized by different groups of people. So it can vary a little bit. Um, but in a general BDSM event, you know, all other factors notwithstanding, the I would say the midpoint, depending on the demographics of where you live, is probably going to be 30s and 40s. Um, because of the, those are the people that are established enough in their careers, have the spare time, have the spare income to be able to go to events like that. However, there is something that you can look into that is called TNG. It stands for the next generation. And it is for people that are 35 and under 
that are kind of newer and younger in the community to go to events that are just for that age group. So you're not necessarily interacting with like only 40 and 50 year olds. So you can look into that, but like, you know, I run to people at events all the time. They're like 18, 19, 20, 21. It's totally not an issue. Um, definitely if an event is on FetLife, you can check beforehand and just look at the profiles of people that are going. And like, if everyone RSVP'd is like 50, 55, 60, like that might not be the crowd you want to be in for like your first event, but that can tell you a lot of information just looking off of that. And, and even if you can't necessarily see on the website what the age ranges are, seeing who is RSVP'd can give you some insight that you maybe don't have. But I feel like 21 is like, that seems like a fine age. Like you're three years past 18, right? You're kind of a little bit more maybe adult life experience underneath you that way, which I think is like a good place to start. And you do meet other people in their 20s. But I think you see more people in like the mid to late 20s than you do like like just 20, you know? Uh, but I don't think you need to be nervous about it. You can always just check. All right, one more question here. <laughs> We're talking about the Roomba. <laughs> No, we are not going to talk about the Matrix Resurrections. I thought the premise of Dollhouse was brought to Whedon by Eliza Dukeshu. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. It would be hilariously a huge coincidence if that was the case. Maybe they have the same kink. Who knows? Mmm. Okay, last question here is going to be from Henry. Do you think DS relationships can work without a sexual relationship? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's just really the, the short answer is that yes, it does work. Um, I am an asexual person. Um, I have had relationships in my life that were both sexual and non-sexual based on like my partner's preference. I am someone that is capable of having sex, even if I don't like, necessarily care about it at all. But... For a lot of people, part of what makes their DS really strong is not having the sexual component to it. And they don't want that. There are a lot of people that are in like monogamous marriages that have non-sexual DS or non-sexual BDSM relationships because they want it to stay something that's non-sexual and not bonded in that particular fashion. Um, like I think you need to be able to have an intimate relationship with the person. That could be romantic, that could be sexual, that could be a close friendship. But I do think you have to have some sort of like bond and intimacy that's based on mutual respect. And that can come from a lot of directions. And that can or cannot involve sex if you do or don't want it to, right? So yeah, I think it's totally possible. Um, and a lot of people just are not motivated by sex in especially DS relationships. I think, um, you know, you're more likely to run into people that are like about sex for like rough sex bdsm type things like you see a lot more people that like want a sex focused like bondage relationship they want um or like masochism or whatever else that they need sex to be fulfilled in that because for them it's like part of a fetish and they need the sex to be part of it in order for it to be an experience they want to have but with ds there's a lot more people that are like romantically motivated or they just want to have something that's just the ds they don't want to have any other kind of like vanilla aspect of the relationship including sex and that works for them, but yeah, totally individual, totally dependent on um, on what you want, what you want to make of it. I would say it is, um, from my experience, I, sh I should add this, um, it is more common, I think, to have DS relationships that include sex than don't if you are doing it as a lifestyle. You can have DS relationships, especially ones that are more like professional, like in the sense that you're hiring a professional uh, to do DS stuff with you. That is more likely than not non-sexual, but even though there are more people that include sex as part of DS, it's certainly not everyone. All right, it is 8.06. I am so tired. I am going to make hot chocolate and find something to watch to keep me awake enough to do a quick workout, and then I'm going to fuck sleep. So thank you all so much for watching. This was just a... a just... A, a, just I don't even know what to say. It's just a smorgasbord of discussion items to talk about. I'm really glad we got to talk about all of this. Super, super fun to have you guys around. There will be another video this week coming out on Sunday. 
the research for the videos I did this week just took me really long. So um, I just ended up kind of like pushing things for video publishing back. I also have a very, very fun interview that's going to be coming out next week as well. So look out for that. That'll be coming out very shortly. And yeah, hopefully you guys stay safe, have fun, and I will talk to you soon.